Uh, I want to speak this morning for a little bit on what is in your house. What is in your house? And I don't mean literally. (laughs) I don't mean all the dust under the couch or the spoon that fell down in between the couch and all that good stuff. Have you ever pulled that couch out and cleaned underneath it? That's I don't recommend doing that very often. You'll get depressed. Um, What is in your house? 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. Anytime you read the scripture, you have to realize, well, you want to try to understand what was the writer communicating in that day. What was he communicating to the people of that day? But also you want to try to discern, how does this apply to me? What is the application for me? Because I obviously don't live back thousands of years ago when this passage was written, but the Word of God is active, it's alive, it's relevant for us today, and it will be relevant if Jesus tarries for generations to come, because it's the Word of God that is just forever faithful, forever true, it's it's applicable to our life. So how does the Word apply to me? How does the word apply to where I am living right now? 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Back in this day, the Old Testament Uh, You could sell off your children. (laughs) Don't get any ideas. (laughs) It's the law against that now. (laughs) But if you had debt, (laughs) you could sell your children to help pay the debt. So that's what was happening right here. Liederman, you'd you'd be a millionaire, buddy. (laughs) You'd do well. (laughs) Oh. Some of you have wanted to sell them. Just hold on to them. They'll get better. Kim and I, I turned 57 last Monday. Kim turns 57 uh, tomorrow. And Kason and Emily and Cameron and Krista cooked a feast for us last night. And uh, it was such a treat. I didn't know my children had it in them like that. Well, uh, probably their uh, other halves uh, were. uh, Anyway, thank y'all. I'm still very full from it. And it was wonderful. And I'm getting fatter, and I don't care anymore. I just don't care. It used to really bother me, but I just don't care anymore. So, hallelujah, maybe one day I'll care again. Uh, (laughs) The creditor's coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. From all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and she shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there, are, there, are not, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. And we thank you that you're just looking for a vessel to pour into, God. And I pray for vessels in this house today, Lord. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. Lord, that you would fill us up to overflowing, as Kirsten spoke about, God, that we would be that light, that witness, that individual that's full of Christ and sharing your light and your love in Jesus' name. Several little points uh, that just stood out to me in this interesting little story. There are so many neat little stories tucked away in that Old Testament And they're all so relevant and applicable to our lives. But first thing that I want to mention is difficulties come to everyone. It's a good way to start off, isn't it? Difficulties come to everyone. If you're uh, enjoying smooth sailing right now, uh, enjoy it. 
that season may pass. Uh, you know, things happen. We had an individual in this church just a few Sundays ago sitting right back there. He didn't know there was a thing wrong with him. Uh, he came to the men's event we had where we cooked fish, uh, ate a pile of fish, um, just living life, having a good time. His name is David Myers. I don't know if you know David, but he's a gruff fella, beard. He looks like uh, he could be on Duck Dynasty. And uh, <clears throat> he was having uh, some breathing issues, went to the hospital, and, ah, uh, you've got a respiratory issue, uh, sent him home, uh, blood sugar's messed up, uh, had some more issues, went to Bonifay, and Bonifay said, you got a lot more going on than blood sugar and respiratory, sending you back to Dothan. Uh, he's eat up with cancer, didn't know there was a thing wrong with him, it's all over his body, given just a very, very short time to live. And I went to see him Thursday. Uh, I went by the hospital. I could not even rouse him up. He was so out of it. So I left and made other stops in Dothan, and his wife called me very upset because they'd gotten the report from the doctor. And, uh, I said, well, I'm going to be in Dothan for a while. I'll come back by there. Maybe I can get him roused up. She said, I can't get him to rouse up either. So I went back by. I walked up to his bed, and he took me by my hand and just started rubbing my hand. And uh, he he said, I want you to say the words over me. And uh, I said, David, I'll say whatever, I'll do whatever you want me to do. He said, I want, I want you to see that they get some fish and fry up some fish and have some cheese grits. He said, and I want to be buried on my property. I said, so you want us to have a going away celebration? He said, that's what I want. And his wife come in and she didn't realize he knew everything that he knew, and she said, what are you saying? I said, he's wanting a going away celebration. And she didn't realize the doctor had told him everything, I think, and he, it was all, the cat was out of the bag. And I said, well, David, I said, none of us are promised tomorrow. I said, I'm certainly not promised tomorrow. I said, no, we don't know when we wake up what we're going to face. I said, are you ready to meet the Lord? He looked me square in the eye and said, no, I am not. I said, well, do you want us to do something about that right now? He immediately changed the subject. He looked at his wife and said, how's Jimmy? <laughs> and she couldn't figure out which Jimmy he was talking about. And this went on a little while. And uh, he looked back at me and he says, Brother Moore, do you think the Lord would forgive an old sinner like me? <laughs> I said, I don't think he would. I know he would. He said, well, I've always lived my life with this philosophy, God, if you'll leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. He said, God, if you won't bother me, I won't bother you. I said, well, it's time to let him bother you. And it's time for us to bother him. And he turned back to his wife, how's Jimmy? <laughs> and she said, forget Jimmy, listen to Brother Moore. <laughs> And I, I, I was about to say, David, can I lead you in the prayer? And I didn't have to say a word. He started calling on the Lord, crocodile tears rolling down his face. He said, Lord Jesus, will you forgive an old sinner like me? He said, Lord, I can't remember all my sins, but you know every one of them, God, and I've lived my life without you, and I need you. And the Holy Spirit fell in that hospital room, and the presence of God came down. There was a peace that came over his face. His whole countenance changed in that little moment right there. So we never know what a day may bring. Difficulties come to everyone at some point in your life. It may not always be smooth sailing. This woman went to Elisha and said, My husband, your servant, is dead. So this man was a servant of the Lord. He died. He leaves behind a wife and sons and obviously debt because the creditor has come to take the sons in payment for the debt. So he was a child of God, he was a servant of God, and yet she was a servant of God, but guess what? She woke up one morning and difficulty was knocking on her front door. The poor widow's in a very difficult place. Her husband died, not only died, he died poor and he left behind debt. 
The creditors is coming to take her sons as payment for the outstanding debt. He was a prophet who feared the Lord. He hadn't heard about the prosperity gospel yet. He hadn't sent a seed faith offering to Mike Murdoch or Brother Copeland or Jesse Duplantis. If he had it, he could have just died a wealthy man, but he didn't get that word. Christianity is not a problem-free life. a matter of fact, sometimes when you accept Christ and name the name of Christ, your problems just start <laughs> because you're in a world that is anti-Christ. The psalmist said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He said, yet for your sake, God, for your sake, we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why do you sleep? Lord, <laughs> can't you see where I am? God, can't you see what's happening around my life? Lord, are you asleep? You ever felt that way? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? Jesus said in John 16, These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to have a flower bed of ease. Oh, I'm sorry I read that wrong. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And if I'm in you, you're an overcomer. That word tribulation comes from the Greek word philipsis. It means pressure. <laughs> Ever felt like you're in the squeeze and the vice grip? Affliction, anguish, trouble, it means to be burdened. The great apostle Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword... As it is written for your sake, again, he's quoting the psalmist that we just read, we're killed all the day long, we were counted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. In other words, it doesn't matter what the day brings, it doesn't matter what pressure comes against me, it doesn't matter the tribulation, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. The New Living Translation, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, in everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure trouble and hardship and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. That's what Paul said. So, Difficulties come to everyone. Amen? This poor widow, difficulty had come to her house. But this poor widow had someone to cry out to. And you and I have someone to cry out to when difficulty knocks on our door. This poor widow woman cried out to Elisha who represented God. He was the man of God. It's been interesting as I have reread through the Old Testament. I started back, well, the end of last year. And uh, reading uh, this particular book of uh, Second uh, Kings, I uh, highlighted and underlined how many times Elisha is referred to as the man of God. The man of God. Uh, powerful miracles that he did. Powerful miracles that he accomplished. So we have someone to cry out to. This woman, when difficulty came her way, when pressure came her way, when the creditor was coming her way, she cried out to the representative of God, the man of God, who represented God. And we have an intercessor who is pleading for us before the throne of God. Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We have someone to cry out to when we have a problem. Christianity is not a problem-free life. Again, let me say that. But when problems arise, when difficulties come out of nowhere, when the doctor's report blows our mind and it's not what we expected, when things happen that just come out of left field and we're not expecting it or planning it, guess what? We have someone like this poor widow did to cry out to, and his name is Jesus. He sees where we are. When your spouse walks out the door and says, I want no more of it, you have someone to cry out to. The psalmist said, I sought the Lord and he heard me. 
and he delivered me from all my fears. You're not just talking to the wind when you're praying to God. You have a God in heaven who hears your cry. You have a God in heaven who bottles up your tears, and it is not in vain. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. God is waiting to listen for you to cry out to him. Psalms 34, 17, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Psalms 57, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed. God, I'm facing a calamity right now, but in your wings, I'm going to take refuge until this passes over. I'll cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who will, would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. We have someone to cry out to today. You do not have to carry your burden alone. You do not have to package up your sorrow and tote it around by yourself. You do not have to take your breaking heart around on your own. You do not have to carry your burden. You do not have to carry your trouble, your sorrow by yourself. We have someone listening for our cry today. And God has limited himself. He has all power. He has all authority. He has all ability. But he has limited himself from acting until his people cry out to him. God responds in answer to prayer. Psalms 91 and 15, he shall call upon me. God is saying of individuals, righteous people, and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. When he cries out to me, Jesus said, ask. It'll be given. Seek. You're going to find. Knock, and it'll be open. That doesn't mean one time. <laughs> That means keep going back. That means having the faith to keep asking. That means having the faith to keep bombarding heaven. Difficulties come to everyone. And when they do, we have someone to cry out to. The question for my title, what do you have in your house? Sometimes you just never know what you have in your own house. You cleaned out your closet lately? Found that thing that you thought was long lost and forgotten? Uh, we're planning to sell our place and uh, put it on the market. And I told Kim yesterday, I said, let's sell house and everything in it. I said, let's just walk out the door with the clothes on our back. She said, well, what if these people have furniture that buy it? I said, they can have more. <laughs> I said, and they can feel, find out what to do with it. I said, let's just sell the whole shooting match. We do not know the worth and the value of the things that seem so significant and so unimportant. I don't have anything, Elisha, but a jar of oil. Some people believe that this woman was saving this jar of oil, this flask of oil, olive oil, for her burial, for her death to be anointed by. What's in your house? I don't have anything. I just got a little bottle of oil that's back there in the back. I saw something in this. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth is made up of ordinary people who do extraordinary things because they use what is in their house. I'm not talking about that home you live in. I'm talking about this house right here where you live. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ on planet earth does wonderful, <laughs> extraordinary, <laughs> glorious things because they use what is in the house that God has put in there for them to use. What is in your house that is not being used? What is in your house today that you are maybe overlooking and say, oh, that's, there's nothing really. That's not valuable. That's not worth a whole lot. Nobody will notice if that gets used or don't get used. There's something in your house that is far greater than what you see, the worth of it. There's something in your house that is immeasurable because it's a gift God has placed inside of you. It's an ability that God has put inside of you. 
I quote this scripture often in James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing you will ever receive from your life. I realize the total context of the scripture, but in application, everything you'll ever receive in your life that's good, it's a gift from God. Oh, no, brother, I've worked hard for it, and I've saved for it, and I've scraped. Yeah, but somebody gave you the breath and the ability to work hard for it. Nobody is a self-made man. There's a God in heaven that gives us the breath we breathe. Take a breath in. There's a heart inside of you that's beating, and one day it'll stop, but God knows how many times it's going to keep beating. And there's some gifts inside of the house today that God is saying, what do you have in your house? What can you put to use? What can you put in the master's service? uh, Paul said in Romans, the New Living Translation, I love the way it reads, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you, If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. He's saying there are all kind of different gifts. Thank God God did not use a cookie cutter when he made us, but he placed different people in the body, different individuals, different giftings, different talents. We all dress different. We all look different. We all worship different. We all act different. Thank God we're all different. It would be a boring world if everybody looked like me, acted like me, liked what I like. It would. So there's something different in everybody. And we think sometimes, well, they're not like me. Thank God they're not like you. Well, they don't worship like I do. Well, thank God they don't. Everybody has something to offer. And we in Pentecost have have tried to cookie cutter it down through the years. And if it wasn't just like us... That's of the devil. New Living Translation, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the... There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who works the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. What's in your house? Is it being used? (laughs) Are you just saving it for the day that you die? Like the little woman. I mean, I'll, I'll put that back in a safe place. No, God has given it to you to be used. Ephesians, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before the world that we should walk in them. Peter said, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Notice every gift is to serve somebody else. The gift is not for me to keep and hold on to. This is mine. Don't you touch it. Every reference to the gifts is use it to serve. What's in your house? What are you using? We talk about when it doesn't seem like much. When it doesn't seem like much, God specializes in, specializes in using what it, to us doesn't seem like much. Well, all I have is a jar of oil. What good is that? What could that possibly do for me, Elisha? My husband's dead. The creditor's coming to take my two sons to pay the debt. I'm in a dilemma. What good is my little flask of oil when it doesn't seem like much? All I have is this one thing. All I have is this one talent. All I have is this one ability. 
I said this a while back. There are a few people in this world that are multi-talented and multi-gifted and can do a lot of different things. And I don't like those people. (laughs) I don't like them at all. (laughs) But they are few and far between. Most of us have a gift. Most of us have something we can really hone in on and, and do our thing. And we really like doing that. When it doesn't seem like much. There's a story in Matthew 15. There was a multitude of people that were thronging around Jesus. Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. His disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in this wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Lord, look around. (laughs) There's not a bakery out here. There's not a McDonald's out here. God, don't you realize where we are? We're in the wilderness. There's nothing out here. Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitude... So they all ate and were filled and took up the seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. Now those who ate were 4,000 men, besides the women and the children. When it doesn't seem like much, what do you have? Well, all we've got seven loaves and two little fish. There's no way that'll go. There's no way that'll satisfy this need. There's no way God can use this. It's so insignificant. It's so little. It's not a drop in the bucket. You're talking about thousands of people, Lord. 4,000 men alone. And if you add a wife to most of those and and a few children, you're talking 10,000 plus people. God, there's no way. I said, what's in your house? Well, we got seven little loaves of bread, but that's nothing. It's amazing how our nothing becomes something when God gets in it. It's amazing how God can take a church in northern Holmes County, one of the poorest counties in the state of Florida, when everybody does a little bit and pulls together, how that church can reach around 200 nations of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through missions ministry. Well, it's not much. I just give a little faith promise every month. You have no idea. John chapter 6, Jesus, another story. Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a great multitude coming toward him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, Jesus asked the question. If Jesus ever asks you a question, he already knows the answer. <laughs> he's doing it to make you think. And that's what he's trying to spur in Philip here. Philip, where are we we going to buy some bread that these people can eat? This he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon's Peter uh, brother, said to him, there's a lad here with five barley loaves and two small fish. Man, at least the other group, we had seven, now we're down to five. (laughs) Five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down about 5,000. When it doesn't seem like much. (laughs) Well, you know, my little contribution, they're not going to notice if I do it or if I don't. All I have is this one little ability. Stop looking through your eyes. And look through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. Luke 21 and 1. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a certain poor widow putting in her two mites. Least value of any coin back that day. He said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. You mean two little coins? When it doesn't seem like much, I was asked, I won't be able to say this, (laughs) I was asked to go to uh, 
a church in Panama City last Sunday and last Saturday night. The pastor had asked me months ago, and I reluctantly said yes at the time and for months tried to figure out a way how I could get out of it. And I had no idea the situation of the church. Oct uh, November, October this year will be four years since Michael came through and wreaked such devastation down there. This church still has a blue tarp on their building. Uh, it completely destroyed the back of their church, their fellowship hall, their Sunday school annex. Um, messed up the front. Uh, I've got pictures on my phone. I wish I'd have thought and had Jason upload them. From the church, the brick is ripped off. They've been in litigation for years with their insurance company. Finally had to hire an attorney to get their insurance money. And I had no idea. I hadn't looked online. I hadn't looked at their pictures. And, and I was to speak Saturday night at their missions banquet, which we had, they had in the, they stood up a steel structure in the back. And it's just a steel structure. No walls, no lights. Um, it's just a hull. And their theme was Jerusalem. Uh, and the Lord gave me a message on rebuilding Jerusalem. Um, and we spoke Saturday night, and the Holy Spirit just settled in that hull, that metal building. The Spirit of God spoke, and the Lord ministered, and the next Sunday, the Sunday morning, we went to service, and the Lord had given me a message for them. And the Holy Spirit just fell, and the Spirit of God was just so real in that church, like he is here. And it was probably some of the best preaching I've ever heard in my life. And I did it. <laughs> and it went on for about an hour. <laughs> and if you know me, I never pat myself on the back, and, and I'm doing that jokingly now. And I have been given opportunities to do that in the past, and I would never do it. Because I didn't think there was anything in the house. I didn't think there was anything in this house that God could use. I didn't think there was anything of any worth. I didn't think there was anything of any value. And I said, God, it's just a little thing of all. What is in your house? The next point is go collect vessels from everywhere. Elisha said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Don't you gather just a few of them. <laughs> you get everyone you can find. You find every vessel, you open every cupboard, you open every cabinet, you look under every table, you get every vessel you can find and you bring it. This is really the great commission in the Old Testament. You go find vessels everywhere, empty vessels, and not just a few of them, and you bring them. Statistics tell us over half the world's population are empty vessels because they've never heard the name of Jesus. Over half of the world, we can't process that because we have a church on every corner and people choose whether they're going to go to church or go to the beach or go to the mountains because it's optional here. Luke 14, Jesus said to him who invited guests to a banquet, he said, when you give a dinner or a supper, don't you ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, you invite the poor. You invite the lame, the maimed, the lame, the blind. You go find you some vessels. They may look broken. 
They may look like worthless pieces of trash. They may look like they need to be in the dumpster, but you go find some vessels. There are empty vessels all in this county. There are empty vessels down every dirt road. There are empty vessels down from your house. There are empty vessels all around us. Then he said, you pour what you have into the empty vessel. I like the Amplified. Then when you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out the oil you have into these containers and you shall set aside each one when it's full. He said, you take that little gift that you thought was worthless. You take that little thing that you have that's a priceless treasure that you've been holding on to and you release it and you pour it into something else. You pour it into someone else. Can I tell you why you were created? Can I tell you why you're living and breathing and taking up space on planet earth? It's not so you can be a rich millionaire. It's not so you can have accolades. It's so you can pour into somebody else. And you think you have nothing to pour. And there's a treasure inside of you. And the Holy Spirit is saying, what is in your house? And more than that, what are you doing with what is in your house? He said, you go find some vessels out there. Oh, mahina, mahaya, mahaya, man. You go find you some empty vessels and don't just bring one or two. You round up every vessel that you can find and you bring them. Peter and John were headed to the prayer meeting in the book of Acts chapter 3, going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So they had three o'clock prayer meeting every day. And there was a lame man from his mother's womb carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. He had his little cup begging, give me a coin, give me a coin, I'm crippled, I can't move. Who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms, and fixing his eyes on him, said, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus. You know there's something more valuable than money? Some people haven't learned that yet. We will the harder things get in this country. Some things money cannot buy. The peace of God, the presence of God, the, the value of the Holy Spirit... Peter says, we don't have any money. We're as broke as you are, buddy, but we do have something that you need. And we're going to pour out of our vessel into your vessel because your vessel's empty. And we got a full vessel. Mm, I, 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 my heart aches for people who come to church empty and leave empty. My heart aches for people who come and just have cultural Christianity because it's the thing to do on Sunday. God has made you to fill you up with his glory. God has created you to fill you up with his Holy Spirit. God has created you to be a vessel that houses the very presence of God Almighty. God has created you to be a vessel that he can pour in, that he can fill, that he can flow through, that he can pour out of. God has not created you just to come and warm a pew. God has created you to house the glory glory of God and he's given you the glory of God to do what contain in yourself no ma'am no sir God has put the glory of God in you to go find an empty vessel somewhere and pour into them we're simply to be a conduit that the glory flows in and out of never to keep it and store it up and bottle it for ourselves. he said go find some vessels And then you're going to take what's in your house and pour into those vessels. Mark chapter 6 and verse 35. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. Already the hour's late. Send them away. Got this crowd of people, God. It's another food problem. We can't feed them all. Let them go back home and make a ham sandwich. Well, turkey, they're Jews. They wouldn't eat ham. Let them go make a turkey sandwich, God. Send them away into the surrounding county and villages, country, and let them buy bread. (laughs) 
It's a lot easier just to tell people, go take care of yourself. I don't want to have to fool with you. Solve your own problem. For they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. You do it. You give them something to eat. Uh, ooh, <laughs> wait a minute, God. I don't have anything. Yeah, look, look inside. Look what you have. Look and see what you have. It's when we give it to him that the blessing and the multiplication comes. Now to him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Is the power working in you today? If it is, you're going to have to get what's in you out and you're going to have to pour it in somebody else. The cry of the Holy Spirit is number seven. The cry of the Holy Spirit. I should have made this a series. Every one of these would have been a message. It came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. Bring me one more vessel. That is what the Holy Spirit is crying out today. Bring me a vessel. I got to fill it. <laughs> bring me a vessel. I want to fill it. Bring me a vessel. I, I was created to pour into vessels. I'm God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I was created to pour in. Bring me a vessel. God is searching for someone to fill. God is searching for someone who's on half empty. God is searching for someone who's got, not got a drop in their tank today. God is searching for some empty vessels saying, bring me a vessel. Just bring me an empty vessel. You bring the vessel, I'll do the filling. You bring the vessel, I'll clean up the vessel. You bring the vessel, I'll put in the vessel. What needs to go in the vessel? I just need you to go get the vessel. I need you to round up the vessels. I need you to go look for vessels. I'll do the filling. Ephesians 1.22, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I don't know that I really understand that scripture, but he is talking about the church being the fullness of God. And the church should have the fullness of God and represent the fullness of God. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and breadth and height, depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ, a filled, overflowing vessel. What is in your house today? We have so much clutter sometimes that we don't even have room for what God wants to pour in us. He said, bring me an empty vessel. <laughs> you got to empty yourself of, I got to empty me of me. If the musicians would come, I'll close with this last thought. Don't stop the flow. Don't stop the flow. 2 Kings 4 and 6, it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. He said, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. The oil stopped. As soon as there were vessels, <laughs> as long as there were vessels, the oil flowed. When the last vessel was filled, the oil stopped. What do I see in all of that? I see a lot of different things. Put it in context so we can understand it. I thought of missions giving in this church. And the platform that we have given the Lord to give through. We're supporting 200 missionaries around the world at $100 a month. You could do the math. That's $20,000 a month. We give $5,000 a month to Fire Bible Translation, translating the Bible into different languages of the world. That's $25,000 a month. We do $2,500 a month to Africa's Hope in building Bible colleges, providing training material to train African pastors. And I thought, God, this church is a vessel for you to channel that out of here. 
And as long as we're channeling, you're going to keep flowing. You're going to keep pouring. You're going to keep supplying. And you put it in whatever context you want. As long as we'll keep bringing people that need filling, the oil is going to continue to flow. He just needs some vessels. I said, he just needs some vessels. And there's some vessels in this house. You sit in here week after week. But can we all be honest with one another? You're empty. Your marriage is empty. Your house is not what it should be. And God's wanting to pour the oil in today and bring the healing. Hmm. Holy Spirit is here this morning. What's in your house? All I've got is a little thing of oil. It's not worth a whole lot. Well, go get it. Now go find a pile of vessels and take that little thing that you have held on to that you didn't think was worth a whole lot to anybody else and start pouring it into them. Mm. Would you bow your heads all over this house?